After the British failure at Gallipoli, another plan is developed to attack the Ottoman Empire from Egypt. Advance from the Suez Canal, across the Sinai Desert, and move up the coast of Palestine. General Archibald Murray, commander of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, begins a deliberate and well-supplied advance across the desert. Thousands of soldiers and Egyptian laborers are set to work building a foot-wide pipeline for water and building a railroad for supplies and reinforcements. The British have erected a complete system of defense to the east of the canal and are awaiting us there with a force many times superior to our small expeditionary force. The British, with an impregnable defense, now take the initiative in a great strategic maneuver designed for total victory. General Murray finally decides to advance across the Sinai and attack the enemy in Palestine. The Desert War has begun. For the soldiers, desert warfare offers a test of endurance that has no equivalent on the Western Front. It is hard to keep marching in the right direction over a featureless landscape. The country is built for defense, and the enemy makes great use of their advantage. The British soldiers march with heavy packs under a burning sun and walk over soft, heavy sand that literally takes the boots right off their feet. Most of these British soldiers have this thirst that they can never get over. You can read their memoirs and they talk about how, how important water suddenly was. You know, one says he can't stand a leaky faucet later on. It was a waste of water. But I mean, the hardships were, were quite extraordinary. And uh, I think it's really unfair to these soldiers to think that they, they had an easy time of it when they, they obviously don't. Now, they don't fight the same sort of artillery battles that you have on the Western Front. And quite frankly, you were more likely to survive the war if you were in this particular theater. But the physical hardships and the fact that you can't go home, uh, in some respects, balances all of this out. It takes six long months for the expeditionary force to move across the Sinai. The Ottoman Fourth Army has dug in on a strong defensive line running from Gaza by the sea to the town of Beersheba. General Murray sets his sights on Gaza and orders General Charles Doble to capture the town and its precious water supply. Doble has a massive number of troops at his disposal, including the mounted desert column. While it provides a strong and mobile force to use against the Turks, the Desert Column also creates the tremendous problem of 10,000 horses that also need water to survive. Water wells are in Gaza. If the British are to succeed, the town must be taken. In December 1916, British Prime Minister Herbert Asquith is voted out of office. The defeat at Gallipoli and the bloody struggle on the Western Front has taken its toll on public morale. And they elect David Lloyd George to lead the country out of the war. George has a strong distaste for all things Turkish. He makes the destruction of the Ottoman Empire a key objective in the war. In Iraq, the tragedy of General Townsend's surrender brands a harsh lesson upon the British War Office. This time, General Percy Lake, who has replaced General Nixon, prepares another advance up the Tigris River. He has 166,000 soldiers for the mission, two-thirds of them Indian. Lake is depending on General Stanley Maud to capture Baghdad. Although London is anxious for a victory, Maud has the foresight to go forward only when his army is fully prepared. Maud's army moves up the Tigris River early in 1917. On February 22nd, they fall upon the Turks at Kut el Amra. By the end of the day, the Turkish commanders fear encirclement. They withdraw their army upriver for the final defense of Baghdad. Maud pursues the retreating Turks and attacks them again on March 4th. As the British drive the Turks upriver once again, they take many prisoners. 
the enemy moves north of Baghdad, leaving the city defenseless. March 11th, 1917, General Maud's army enters Baghdad unopposed. The conquering British receive high praise for their conduct from the local citizens. One Ottoman historian will write, Though this was the 30th time that Baghdad had fallen to a conqueror, never before had the event passed off so quietly. You know, Maud wants to take Baghdad, and he, he is able to take Baghdad. And in, in some respects, it was a morale-lifting victory for the British. But he clearly can't go beyond Baghdad. Uh, and now it's, it's now a problem of holding on to Baghdad. But by this time, the British have already made a deal with the French to control the oil from Basra to Baghdad. They had done this as early as 1916, you know, before this city was conquered. With summer on the way, carrying all of its bugs and diseases, and with supply lines stretched thin, Maud decides to keep his men dug in around Baghdad. They will roast in the unbearable heat, but at least they won't be fighting. In the spring of 1917 on the Palestine front, General Murray sends his massive army forward to capture the city of Gaza and its badly needed water wells. The Ottoman Fourth Army has established a strong defensive position on a line from Gaza to the town of Beersheba, protected on its left flank by the Judean hills. On March 26th, the British advance and fight hard to gain much ground, losing many troops along the way. Shrapnel had merged in a writhing white cloud over the advancing men. They plodded out of a haze of earth and smoke only to disappear into another barrage. Every yard must have seemed death to them. Some thousands of the poor chaps bled on that day. By the afternoon, Gaza is almost completely surrounded, with the Turks preparing to give up the town. Suddenly, General Philip Chetwood commanding cavalry of the desert column, fears that his men are being surrounded by the enemy and orders them to withdraw. Without the cavalry, the infantry becomes exposed to counterattack. So it too is ordered to fall back. The soldiers are bewildered. In the words of one division history, they considered they had captured Gaza and that they had been dragged like a dog on a leash from their prize. On April 17, 1917, General Murray strikes at Gaza for a second time. A single British infantry division advances across a two-mile front. The fighting goes on for three days, but one division isn't enough, and thousands of soldiers die trying to break the Turkish line. On making their final charge, the Turks stood up and received them with hand grenades, fleeing then to another line of trenches. Our poor chaps occupied the trench for a time, and then the Turks attacked with fixed bayonets, killing or capturing nearly every man. The only reason the Turks do not counterattack is because they are low on ammunition. In June, Murray is dismissed and replaced by General Edmund Allenby, fresh from the Western Front. Allenby is a large man with a bad temper. Behind his back, he is known as Bull Allenby. But he is also a professional in the trade of warfare and makes it clear to London that he will not move against the Gaza-Beersheba line until he gets plenty of reinforcements. General Allenby, in many respects, is sort of a bundle of contradictions because he could be very severe at times. There's this famous incident when he dresses down a soldier for not wearing a helmet, only discovering to discover that he's talking to a corpse. Uh, but uh, he, does the, he does this in France. And he's really this hard-driving commander with a reputation that was somewhat diminished. And, but when he comes to the, the Palestine front, uh, he's going to get a, a, a brand new uh, start. And he turns out to be a first-rate commander because he's everywhere. Uh, in fact, his own men had a signal, the, the bloody bulls loose, when he was making his inspection tours. But he has this really close contact with his men. 